after the May 31st event. This day, I am calling Chasing's End of Innocence. But perhaps as a bit of food for thought, I'd like to suggest that that day may have come sooner than we know. How many of you have seen Chaser video from Tuscaloosa in 2011? Okay, there were many, many people out there chasing storms, some of whom, like our, our non-Twistex fatality on 31 May, some of whom were simply local, locals chasing targets of opportunity. My question, and I don't expect you to answer it, how many chasers, how many people, maybe more accurately, how many people have died in tornadoes with video cameras in their cars? There may be people out there who were chasing who died in tornadoes that we don't know about because we didn't know who they were and no one of any consequence here knew they were chasing. Why would that happen? Why would people be so willing to risk their lives to obtain tornado video? <coughs> we, all of us, bear some responsibility for that. And if they haven't happened yet, well actually they already have happened, haven't they? We lost one on 31 May, and we at least one. How many more will die or be seriously injured to the point of, I don't know how many of you are familiar with what tornado injuries can be. My wife was at the emergency room in Norman Regional Hospital on the 3rd of May. And what she saw was horrible, that they were the people that lived. So we have some things to think about, I believe. And as a consequence, this talk is going to perhaps be a little uncomfortable. Those of you who know me uh, already probably are prepared for that. Well, the technology is interesting when it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm, okay, I'm still not doing it. Frustrating. <laughs> Okay, well, we'll hope that this works. I'm going to give you a very brief history of chasing. I'm going to keep it brief. Uh, this is a picture of myself back when I had a waistline, lots of hair, and uh, was brand new to storm chasing. This was a shot taken in 1973. Uh, one of the people there, the guy in the middle, Al Muller, was my chase partner. Anyway, uh, so Dave Hoadley, who is here tonight, is, to my knowledge, the first real storm chaser. Uh, there may be others we don't know about, but he was the first. And I might add that he's probably always been the best among us. The first scientist storm chaser was Neil Ward, who at the time was working for the Severe Storms Laboratory and convinced the Highway Patrol to accompany him on, a, on the, the first scientific storm chase. When I arrived uh, back in graduate school at the end of my military sojourn, you can tell by my face I had made a promise I'm not going to let a razor touch my face for at least a year. So I know this is a year at least after I got back. Anyway, um, when 
I got there, the atmosphere, if you'll pardon the expression, was a buzz with excitement about the prospect of storm chasing. I had thought about it earlier as a young man, and I suddenly found myself being invited to participate in the most incredible adventure that I would ever possibly imagine. And needless to say, I was not about to decline that opportunity. What we saw in the 1970s and 80s was what I would call a slow growth period. A lot of us were so enthusiastic about chasing that we gave public interviews and we would try to wax eloquently about how great it was and all the wonderful things that we thought we were doing. Uh, slowly but surely, where we had increasing media attention, the media have consistently and during the entire history of storm chasing, been focused on the premise that storm chasing is a form of insanity. And that all of us who do so are lunatics. And what they're trying to do, their damnedest to do in their interviews, is to get you to do something loony so they can say, See? All of these people are crazy. So, we got increasing media attention. The idea that people are doing crazy things actually appeals to other crazy people. <laughs> Occasionally, in central Oklahoma or western Oklahoma, we would have chaser convergence events, maybe as many as five or ten vehicles. <laughs> and we knew everybody in every vehicle. So it was like a get-together under the vortex. And we used to say, we'll meet you at the vortex. Man, did we underestimate what was going to happen. In 1994-95, the vortex project became a reality. The idea of systematic mobile data collection for aiding the scientific understanding of storms gained a great deal of credibility over the years, and that culminated at the time in the Vortex One project, which was an amazing scientific experience. How many of you have ever chased for a scientific uh, uh, team? It is a very different experience than a personal chase. You actually have to be responsible. You have a job to do. You can't just wander around and do whatever you want. So it, it's a whole different process. And then came the hope. And it was like the opening sequence in Jaws. And I think some of us began to appreciate that this had kind of gotten out of hand. And I think the immediate outgrowth of the hope was an explosive growth in the number of chases. And, look, it's very easy to understand that. After all, I mean, everybody gets their notion of reality from movies, right? Well, sadly, there's a lot more truth in that ridiculous statement than there should be. The movies are about entertainment. You and I both know that I could sit here in, in 40 minutes, not exhaust all of the scientific blunders in that movie. But movies are not about science or understanding science, are they? What are they about? Entertainment. You sit there mindlessly and try to get lost in the story. And so, if they screw up the details, all of them, <laughs> You just sit there, fat, dumb, and happy, and smile. And those of us who know all of the mistakes they made, they're making are cringing because none of the correct versions of those mistakes would have changed that story in any meaningful way. But there it was. All right. Then came storm trees. The soap opera on TV. The collection of 
sort of the, the anthology of severe storms all rolled into one chase. Storms from different states and different years all merged together into one backdrop for one story, the soap opera. And of course, that has continued the explosive growth in chasing. Many of you are here for one or more of those reasons. I don't necessarily want to discourage you from being here. It wouldn't matter what I want anyway, would it? You'd tell me to go to hell, and I'd, I'd say I would have told somebody the same thing. Why should, it's not some club. You don't have to st survive a membership exam. Nobody is going to black call you because of who you are and what you think or do. To be part of something like this, you have to be responsible, at least for the period of the experiment. Okay, fine. So where are we now? The exact distribution of chasers on this curve may not look exactly like a bell curve, but basically on the, on the bottom, the x-axis, we have increasing irresponsibility, and on the left is increasing frequency, so we have a mean of irresponsibility somewhere. What does that say? The mean is not zero, is it? All of us, myself included, have done irresponsible things. There are no saints. I make no claim to be one. But there's clearly a distribution. There was a distribution of chasers when there were fewer than 20 of us. We already identified who some of the extreme chasers were. They were the ones doing the risky stuff. Getting caught up in the wisps of concentration of condensation on the margins of a debris cloud. Hanging on to bridge abutments for dear life. That was present in our distribution right at the very beginning. Well, what happens when you increase the sample size? More and more people show up. Whoops. I did the damn thing that I promised that we would. <laughs> more and more people start showing up. <laughs> this thing is tricky. On this side of the distribution, more than two standard deviations from the mean toward irresponsibility. And I'm not going to mention any names because you know damn well who they are. And you know why you know who they are? Because it's more about them than about the storms. It's more about self-promotion. Look at me. Look at all the stuff I have festooned on my car. The crazy decals. The names I give my chase to. <laughs> who would claim, who would claim to dominate the atmosphere? <laughs> I saw but two tornadoes. Both of them were EF5. And no, I don't agree with the Weather Service. It was not an EF3 tornado. I don't care what they think. They're flat. So here was more from my perspective. I'm on the east side of Moore, on Southeast 149th Street, which in Moore is 19th Street. And I'm looking due west, and this photograph, taken at 3.19 p.m., is taken about the time the school that was the source of the EF5 rating was being flattened. So I just happened to get a, my first good view of the tornado 
was about the same time the EF5 damage was being done. I had uh, chosen not to chase that day. One of the reasons I chose not to chase was that I don't like chasing east of I-35, and I thought, incorrectly, that all the storms would fire and move off into the jungles east of I-35 and be unchaseable. At least, I don't chase there. So I was doing what I call armchair chasing, sitting in my office, looking at data and watching things unfold. And shortly before this image, I realized that a supercell had set up west of Oklahoma City. And I thought, well, I mean, come on, it's, it's only a short distance from where I live. Why would I not chase it? So I left my house, and a few minutes later, the storm looked like this. And about the time my photograph that you just saw was taken, I was where the white X was, and there was the debris ball. So, and the roads here, the grid is our one mile section line, so you have some sense of how far away I was. When I stepped out of my vehicle and saw this storm, not only did I see it, but I heard it. Now this is far from the first tornado that I've heard. And no, it doesn't sound like a damn freight train. <laughs> I don't know where that comes from, or why people insist on saying it. Doesn't sound like a freight train. The tornadoes I hear in open country sound like a waterfall. <coughs> a very loud waterfall. What this sounded like was a gigantic dump truck filled with coarse gravel dumping its load in a concrete parking lot. A continuous rattling, cracking, crunching sound. And I knew where I was. And I knew where the tornado was. So here is a path of my chase. Here was my trek relative to the track. I started in Hall Park, and you can count up the miles. It was about a 10 mile chase, what I call a gentleman's storm chase. <laughs> and I ended up in the parking lot of a school just north of 149th uh, on Bryan Avenue, if you know the area. And I sat there and watched it for a while, and I was thinking, they had said on the radio that it was coming due west on 19th, and I'm thinking, hmm, I'm sitting due east of it. Am I going to have to move? And as the tornado got closer to me, it uh, began to execute this turn to the left, and I could see from what I was watching that it was turning to the left, and that I was okay to watch it. And I continued to watch it, but it became more and more invisible because of the dust and debris and precip wrapping around it. And so as it was passing to my north, I got hit by the gust front, and that ended my chase. Done. So I started to go home. I had no feeling of excitement. I was not thrilled with another tornado capture. I was horrified by the feedback. <laughs> I was horrified by what I had seen. And I, it was a feeling that I'd never had in my life as a storm chaser, ever. If I ever found out about fatalities, it was always well afterward. Never was it obvious to me that I had just seen a terrible killer tornado. And so, my sense of elation had disappeared. I couldn't, I couldn't feel good about it. Curiously, on the way home, what did I discover? But all roads were packed with people. About half of them were locals out chasing. The other half were people trying to get the hell out of there. 
and it was a traffic jam. What had taken me 15 minutes, well, maybe a little longer, to traverse on the way to there took me 45 minutes just to get home. Little did I know that was a foretaste of what was to come. In late May, I was chasing with Tempest Tours. I do one tour a year with them. And uh, we had been very excited about our experiences during the preceding days. We had seen a lot of great storms, everything but a tornado. We managed to avoid the terribly dangerous and scary Bennington tornado. <laughs> One of these days, I'm going to put up a Facebook page of all the tornadoes I've missed. But uh, be that as it may, this was our view at 6.05 p.m. on a little tiny side road, I forget the name of it, uh, west of El Rio. And at the time I took this picture, our tour director, Bill Reed, and my, Brian Morganti, and I think probably Chris too, were honking the horns of the vehicle saying, come on, we gotta get the hell out of here. It's coming at us. At the time, I had what I like to refer to as target fixation. I was looking at this spectacular thing and I didn't want to leave. It took everything in my willpower to drag myself away from that. Get in the vehicle so we can get the hell out of there. Well, thank goodness. Thank goodness for cooler heads. So, there's our position. The X marks the spot at the time that picture was taken. And I think everybody felt, given the motion of the storm that we had seen preceding that, that the tornado was going to move more or less to the east and we'd be fine. That was not the case. The tornado was moving southeast. And when it's moving right at you, it's difficult to grasp that it's moving right at you. So, at any rate, we boogied out of there. We were not in the midst of the hordes. And this is our track. We dove south out of the track of the tornado, or right to the edge, then sort of briefly went back into the future path and then continued our dive south. And we got far enough south that for all intents and purposes, we were out of danger. So we continued to drive east, and at that point we had sort of lost visual contact with the tornado for the most part. And we, as we approached 81st, this is the view we had. And I remember Chris saying to me, it looks like a mesocyclone on the ground. And I thought, yeah, that, that's certainly one way to interpret what we're seeing. If you'll notice on the left side of that, you see these vertical columns. Oh, sure, sure look like such a vortices to me. And in fact, at the time this was taken, this was roughly two minutes after the Twistex vehicle was hit by the tornado. So it was this giant thing which sort of defied our imagination at the time. A number of years ago, if you've read through any of my voluminous essays on the web, I have an essay about what is the definition of a tornado. And I raise the question, if the, tor if the mesocyclone has tornadic wind speeds, is it not a tornado? And I think in this case, the distinction between mesocyclone and tornado kind of disappeared. Kind of. What I say is the atmosphere produces vortices of all shapes and sizes and strengths. And what we call them is our problem. The atmosphere has no problem. It just does what it does. And we like to put things in little boxes and say, this is a tornado and this is not. We like nice hard boundaries in between them. That's not the way the atmosphere works. So whatever you want to call it. 
We'd avoided danger on our chase. It was a tremendous success at the end of our tour, which had been very successful up to that point. To my knowledge, the tornado had been an open country. I knew of no other impacts at the time as I was going home. News of, of the death of the Twistex team got to me the next day. And my first reaction was the same as everyone. Shock and surprise. Surely the first chaser to be killed would have been anyone other than Tim. That's what we all thought. So, Tim was experienced. He was very safety conscious. How could this happen to him? How could this happen? Well, Tim had a reason to be close to the tornado. His mission, his self-imposed mission, was to collect the data that no one prior to Tim had ever been able to be successful at collecting. He had broken new ground. At one point early in his career, I was asked to write a letter of recommendation on behalf of his funding by National Geographic, and I was more than willing to give him as glowing a recommendation as possible. I supported what he was doing, and I thought, this is a fine example of a responsible chaser. And I, obviously, I see no reason to change that opinion today. He was a fine example. Tim's mission, unfortunately, inherently put him into great danger. His job, his reason to be there, required him to take risks far greater than most chasers. Except, of course, for the two sigma and beyond chasers on my responsibility spectrum who seem to take a certain amount of delight in screaming in their videos, WE'RE IN THE TORNADO! <laughs> when you look at 90% of those videos, they're not in the tornado. If they were, they wouldn't be screaming. They'd be begging somebody to come help if they were still alive. <coughs> now, Tim took on a task that was inherently more dangerous than almost all responsible chasers. Before Tim, there had been some efforts, such as Toto, to try to put instrument packages inside tornadoes. They had essentially depending on how you slice it. It essentially all failed. It came close a couple of times. Why did they fail? Because those chasers were not willing to take the risks that Tim took. When I first saw Tim's videos, I was thinking, holy bleep. He's doing incredible things but he's taking incredible risks. So he had a number of successful placements of his probes. <coughs> offered pioneering looks at the internal structure of tornadoes. Unprecedented. But, I have formulated my own personal law of danger. Just because you've done something dangerous a bunch of times and come out of it smelling like a rose doesn't mean the next time you're going to do the same thing. How many of you have ever done hiking in the mountains? Have you ever hiked to the top of a mountain and had a lightning storm develop around you? Do you know how many campers and hikers die every year from lightning storms? That's inherently irresponsible behavior. But everybody says, well, you know, I don't care about that stuff. I'm invulnerable. That, you know, you only
Certainly some kind of weakling would be afraid to do that. Well, the law of danger says if you make the same, if you take the same risks over and over again, one of these days, they're going to reach up and bite you. We can think of examples of people who have done dangerous things, Steve Irwin, and so on. Each of those gentlemen died doing what they love. But in order to do what they love, they had to take risks. I understand those people because I understand that every time I chase, I'm taking a risk. And I try to keep that in mind. Any chaser can make a mistake. I've made mistakes, for sure. Many of them. And if you'll notice, I've never been afraid to own up to them. To own them. And say, this, well, I did this, and it was dumb, and here's why it was dumb, and here's why you shouldn't do it. Chris Novi has taken a lot of static for some of the misadventures he's been in. And I admire the hell out of him. Because he's never been afraid to stand up and say, yes, I did something stupid. And here's how to avoid it. He cares more about the rest of us than about his own ego. He can take the crap because he knows he's doing the right thing. Any one of us can make a mistake. My next chase could be my last. All it takes is for the atmosphere to do something I didn't expect. Has that ever happened to any of you? Yeah. In retrospect, Tim and his crew, unfortunately, were at the top of the list of people we could have expected to pay that price. That's the truth. Another thing that's come up since El Reno was, well, it had to be something really special. Well, no. It doesn't have to be special. El Reno wasn't some sort of evil, malevolent storm going out there trying to kill people. And it didn't have any particular characteristics that distinguished it from dozens of other storms. EF5 storms are rare, but they happen every year, somewhere. This storm only produced one big tornado. I'm not going to count the subvortices, and I'm certainly not going to count the satellites. There was no trail of tornadoes behind it, like on the Moore tornado in 99. So it only produced one significant tornado. Gosh, it became a large multi-vortex wedge. Has that never happened in history before? Is it a surprise that a tornado could be wrapped in rain and be hard to see? Is it shocking that a tornado would undergo rapid changes in speed and direction? Has that never happened in the history of tornado science? For an experienced chaser, for someone who's seen a, ch a storm or two, no. El Reno doesn't have to be special. Every storm is unique. Every storm is as unique as a fingerprint. But that doesn't mean it's special. We all have unique fingerprints, but not all of us are special. <laughs> what I say is that what we've been talking about in terms of lessons learned from El Reno is simply a new crowd of chasers relearning what the old crowd of chasers, old farts like me, well, we've known and learned many years ago and have done our damnedest to try to share that knowledge with everybody. I haven't kept it a secret. I admit 
If you're going to browse my web page, you better bring a lunch. Okay? Because it's going to take a while to read all of it. But we're not learning anything from El Reno we didn't already know. Rain wrapped tornadoes are dangerous. Gosh. What a revelation. Being close to a, jaw, a large wedge, it's hard to tell when it changes speed and direction. Duh. We had experiences like that back in the 70s and the 80s. Tornado, well, you know, you can read the list. Another one that cracks me up is everybody seems to be discovering that the tornado is the wind, not the cloud. You look and you see a funnel, that isn't necessarily the tornado. The condensation funnel is a cloud. But the tornado is the wind. And the wind, unless you put something in it like pre super dust, is invisible. You can see right through it. Real-time radar that you have in your vehicles, guess what, guys? It ain't real-time. There's about a five or even ten minute delay in those radar pictures you see. When you're racing the train to the crossing, do you think a five minute delay matters? <laughs> when you're trying to judge your ability to make that crossing before the train hits you, and the last picture you had of the train is five minutes ago? That's what you're trying to do if you get in close and you're put under a threat by the tornado. You're playing a game trying to race the tornado. Gosh, what did we learn this year? We learned hmm, it's probably not safe to drive into a tornado. Golly! At what point in his race south did Mike Bettis think to himself, oh bleep, we're driving into a tornado. And what in the world would possess it to keep on doing it? I've never heard an answer to that question. I'd like to get one sometime. What was he thinking? He can speak after I do. I'd like to hear it. How many of you have ever been within the path of a tornado? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have been within a quarter mile or less of a tornado? Not quite so many. How many of you have been within the debris cloud? Not me. A few. How many of you have had to race with a tornado to stay ahead of it and to avoid being overrun? Yeah. Imagine. Yeah, how many of you have had large, heavy tornado debris falling around you? Not just insulation, but I mean sticks and objects. No cows. <laughs> if you've seen cows, you know, please, please identify yourself. When you're talking. <laughs> so, out of all these clearly dangerous things, all of us who raised our hands to one or more of these, all it would have taken would have been some unforeseen circumstance, and we'd be there. So if, yeah, okay, no one's immune, okay, blah, blah, okay, I think I've covered that. So here's a wedge. This was from Gene Moore from uh, about the time the Twist X team was killed. You're looking at that, you have to make a decision about which way to go and what to do. It's hard to estimate speed and direction because it's just this big massive thing on the horizon. What's your choice going to be? Somebody has talked about the fact that a road that you think is paved may not be paved five miles ahead of you or, or one mile ahead of you. I've certainly had that awful experience. 
Anything can go wrong. Wedges are dangerous. We found out that the bear's cage is the dumbest idea anybody ever thought of today. Uh, that was my term. I coined that term. I'd be curious to hear why it's so stupid, but apparently it's really dumb. <laughs> Getting into the bear's cage is inherently dangerous. Anytime you drive under the edge of a wall cloud, you're at risk. In the Spencer tornado in 1998, my wife and I were chasing, and the road took a turn such that it was going to put us under the wall cloud. And I'm looking up at the edge of the wall cloud as it's going over above us, and I'm thinking, gosh, this, this seems awfully risky. And then the more I thought about it, holy smoke, there, there's been a tornado in there. We could be driving into the tornado. So what did we do? We stopped, we did a UE, and we got the hell out of there. If we want to honor Tim and his teammates, if we want to have their loss mean anything, we have to think seriously about why we need to be in close to large, dangerous tornadoes. And we better have a damn good reason. One thing I will not say, and that is to be branded a thrill seeker, is some kind of negative label. I'm a thrill seeker. If I wasn't thrilled by going out and watching nature's display of awesome power, if that somehow didn't move me in some way, I wouldn't be doing it. There's nothing wrong with being a thrill seeker. The point is, do you have a reason for doing what you want, what you what you're doing? Can you justify it? Can you say, I'm being responsible, even though I am seeking thrills? Consider what you can do to advance the positive side of chasing. If you make a mistake, own it. Be willing to step up and say, I made a mistake. There's nothing <coughs> wrong with that. The Lord knows I've made enough of it. Okay. That is the way we honor their legacy. If people are going to chase, and I, I don't think anybody is going to, or many people are going to stop because of Tim. In my view, Tim would not want that. The man I knew would not want to be responsible for having made a mistake and turned you away from the possibility adventures and experiences of chasing. Just be responsible. That's all. Storm chasing is a hobby. I get tired of hearing about this all the time. Chasers aren't out there to save lives. Chasers aren't out there to save lives. So quit saying that crap. It's a lie and you know it. You don't save lives when you call in a report. The people who save lives are the weather service and the emergency managers. You help them sometimes when you call in a report. You can say, I've helped the system save lives. You got no business hanging around after a tornado has gone through some community. You're only in the way of the people who know what they're doing. Now, if somebody's lying in front of you, and obviously in need of first aid, then fine. Stop and render first aid. But get the hell out of a tornado-damaged area as quickly as you can. When I was at Tessa last weekend, we heard an amazing story from a first responder who's also a chaser, who told the story of the fact that his emergency vehicles were unable to take people forward to hospitals because the roads were clogged with sightseers and chasers. 
And it was a very moving and tragic story. I wish I could play that tape for you. It was really a, a, good, a good story. Made a big uh, impact on me. There are many aspects of storm chasing that are great, and a few of them might make you a few bucks. If you have any ambitions that storm chasing is going to turn you into a rich and famous person, forget it. I've chased since 1972. A little math. And that means that this will be my 42nd year of chasing. I started chasing when a good number of you were never, hadn't been born. Every time I go out there and look at real storms, I see things I've never seen before. I see amazing things, fascinating things. That's why I keep doing it. I don't know it all, never will. I don't claim to know it all. I'd like to think that experience means something. I'd like to think I could share some things with you and some of my old fart colleagues could also do the same. We could share some things with you that you would benefit from. I'm not hiding. You can get my email address, I'll just do a Google search on my name, you'll jump up on my web page. You can send me any emails you like. Hate mail is fine. Doesn't bother me. I'm not close to the best of storm chasers. Roger may be. I'm not. I don't feel any need to be the best. Why? Because with me, chasing storms is not about me. It's about storms. That's all I've ever wanted to do. Even experienced chasers can have problems. If you're seeking fame, I'll let you read this quote. It's one of my favorites. How much time do I have? Five? Okay, well, I will do this quickly. I'm going to run through these very quick, not provide any captions. We can talk about them, any of them, if you wish, later. But this is just a collection of some of my favorite chase images. Some of you might recognize some of these. It's even better in a dark room. <laughs> Would you drive into that? <laughs>
The reason I did this at the end of my talk, it's a small tribute to a friend of mine, my former chase partner, Al Muller, who is now uh, <coughs> very debilitated by Alzheimer's disease. The, uh, the man that I knew no longer exists. So to all intents and purposes, he's dead. And he always ended his slideshows with some nice eye candy. So with that, I will end my part. Dave Hoadley, I think, needs to come up and make an announcement. And after he's done, we can I'll entertain questions or comments or death threats. <laughs> but I was asked to speak on behalf of a couple of uh, research scientists in upstate New York who were snowed in, would otherwise have been here and probably given you a little better presentation of what they're working on. This is the El Reno survey, very detailed, comprehensive analysis of the Reno, El Reno storm. They've cast a, white, a wide net starting last November to gather all the video they can and digital photos from chasers who were there at El Reno. Some of you who were there may not have seen this uh, uh, site, uh, which is currently on StormTrack at StormTrack.org. Look under Advanced Weather and Chasing, El Reno Survey, which I posted there on their behalf. You'll find all kinds of details about how to submit surveys, uh, submit the information that you have will help them to do a better study of what happened that day. They're particularly interested in lightning activity, uh, unusual kinds, uh, so, but they are collecting this to make it not only to do their research, they will make this available as a large body of information to other research scientists and other people who are interested in doing similar studies or other studies about El Reno. And they will be careful about copyright protection, they're very conscious of that. So before they make anything available like this to other people, they will uh, definitely check with the originator of the source. So uh, you can also find it just Google El Reno Survey. Anyway, they'd appreciate it. love hearing from people who haven't responded yet. If you have information, if you have photography, please let them know. And uh, they're doing a really serious and really good job. The only private study I know of outside of the government, NSSL, or other people. So uh, already Gene Moore has contributed, Tim Marshall, Skip Talbot, uh, Sean Casey, dozens of other chasers, so they'd love to hear from you, and uh, that's all I have. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Doswell. We really appreciate that. Just a couple more announcements real quick.